widest subscription. Here and in other developing countries, radio's daily menu of music, talk and drama is the most affordable and the most accessible source of information and entertainment. The round-the-clock signals of almost 600 stations are a daily companion in the home, the workplace, the school, the mall, and on the road. With its ubiquity and accessibility, radio provides the connection between the diverse communities that comprise the Filipino nation. How has radio come to occupy a central role in the forging of a national consciousness and, perhaps, the crafting of a national identity. Philippine radio was born during the American colonial period. In the early 1900s, radio broadcasting was in the experimental stage in the Western world. By the time it came to Manila in the 1920s, it had developed into a commercial enterprise. American businessmen brought in radio primarily as a medium for the introduction of American consumer goods to Filipinos. The first radio broadcast experiment in the Philippines is believed to have been conducted by an American woman, Mrs. Redgrave, in early 1922 from Nichols Airfield with a 5-watt transmitter. But most credit Henry Herman, another American, as the first to conduct commercial radio broadcasting experiments in the Philippines. Herman began test broadcasts from three stations in June 1922, less than two years after the first American commercial station. As a colony of the United States, the Philippines adopted the American call letters KZ for its radio stations. At the end of the 1920s, other stations had come and gone, with two surviving to the following decade, KZIB and KZRM of the Radio Corporation of the Philippines, or RCP. In 1929, RCP put up KZRC in Cebu City, the first outside Manila. The radio business attained growth and a measure of stability in the 1930s. By the end of the decade, there were four stations, two owned by Americans, and two by Jose Amado Araneta, the first Filipino major player in the broadcasting business. Manila stations invested in shortwave transmitters, making it possible for Manila programs to be heard in other countries as well as on ships at sea. From the 1920s to the 1930s, radio became the new medium for advertising imported as well as local consumer products, making radio a lucrative business. Radio programming in the 1930s was undoubtedly an effective means of importing America into the Philippines. Programming was mostly entertainment, music, the lively banter of MCs, and short newscasts, all patterned after American programming of the period. Americans were the first radio managers and performers, setting the format, tone, and technical quality of programming. American English filled the air, spiced with the American sense of humor. However, expressions of the local culture were soon heard on the air. At first, Filipino singers and musicians performed American music live on air to complement recorded music from the United States. It was customary to imitate the voice, timbre, and style of American singers, and contests were held to pick the best imitators. In the mid-1930s, kundimans and Filipino folk songs began to be heard. Before the decade of the 1930s was over, three of the four commercial stations aired several Filipino language programs. While many of the radio stars were Americans, more Filipinos and Filipino mestizos attained celebrity status. In 
some of the most endearing comedians whose careers spanned decades first made a name in radio. Others crossed over from vaudeville, while others also appeared in movies. A few also performed on stage. In the late 1930s, as the war became imminent, radio became an important source of news. The colonial government opened its own radio station, KZND. On December 8, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and, within a few hours, the Philippines. The war had come to the Philippines, and radio became an ideological battleground between the Filipino-American resistance and the Japanese invaders. The American High Commissioner in the Philippines instructed KZRH manager Bert Silen to help coordinate war information. As the Japanese aggressively advanced towards Manila, the United States Armed Forces in the Far East, or the USAFE, retreated to Bataan and Corregidor. Before they left, the USAFE blew up private and commercial radio equipment to render them useless to the Japanese. However, at KZRH, Silen instructed his chief technician, Simeon Cheng, to save and bring to Corregidor a shortwave transmitter and other radio equipment. In Corregidor, Cheng and military radio engineers installed a makeshift radio station, which started operation on January 5, 1942. General Douglas MacArthur christened the station the Voice of Freedom. When the Japanese entered Manila on January 2, 1942, their propaganda corps found KZRH equipment in the Hecock building and transmitting equipment at the Hialeah. Twelve days later, the Japanese broadcasters were on the air. Relay stations were established outside the capital, including those in Cebu, Davao, and Iloilo. A distinctive feature of the Japanese-controlled radio was a 15-minute calisthenics program called Radio Taiso. Lessons in the Japanese and Filipino music and Japanese and Filipino languages and literature were on the air. The Japanese controlled radio listening by banning radio sets unless registered with the authorities. The registered sets were rigged to make them incapable of receiving shortwave signals from the United States. The measures were supposed to protect the Filipinos from enemy broadcasts, which the Japanese saw as deadlier than enemy bombs. Meanwhile, the Filipino-American resistance ran underground radio stations. Until late April 1942, the Voice of Freedom fought a propaganda duel with the Japanese-controlled Manila radio. The nightly broadcast was transmitted on different frequencies to avoid detection and jamming by the Japanese. Carlos P. Romulo read the news and commentary in English, written by Romulo, Leon Maria Guerrero, and Salvador P. Lopez. Francisco Isidoro translated and read the program in Tagalog called Tinig ng Kalayaan. Before Bataan fell, Romulo was evacuated to Australia and Norman Reyes took over as announcer. In Cebu, KZRC continued broadcasting until the Japanese overran the province in May 1942. For four months after Corregidor fell in early May 1942, another resistance radio, the voice of Juan de la Cruz, went on the air from Manila. Carlos Malonzo and his wife, Violet Brown, ran the station until they were caught by the Japanese. Guerrillas operated sporadic underground broadcasts. Filipinos caught or suspected of listening to guerrilla broadcasts were tortured or executed by the Japanese. Mere possession of a shortwave radio was punishable by death. In spite of this, Filipinos defied the restriction. Less than half of the estimated 80,000 sets were registered. Filipino technicians hired by the Japanese to rig the sets secretly restored the shortwave capacity of the radios. Many were able to listen to broadcasts from San Francisco and Australia. On October 20, 1944, 
MacArthur landed on Leyte and put the voice of freedom back on the air. Five months later, the station was moved to Manila and turned over to the restored Philippine Commonwealth government. In 1947, an independent Philippine Republic proposed to the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, to change the call letters of Philippine radio to PI for Philippine Islands. The ITU rejected the proposal but gave the Philippines the call letter D, which until then was used exclusively by Germany and which stood for Deutschland, Germany's name in the German language. Post-war Philippine radio, however, changed more than its call letters. Philippine broadcasting today is partly a reaction to the war experience. While both the Americans and the Japanese used radio for propaganda, Filipinos perceived the two differently. The people compared the lively programming of pre-war radio, which was perceived to be free and credible, and the more overtly controlled radio during the war. In the battle for Filipino consciousness, the Americans won. Philippine radio grew tremendously in the three decades after the war. The first commercial stations to open were KZRH and KZPI. On July 4, 1946, the two stations, as well as government station KZFM, covered live the inauguration at the Luneta Park of the Second Philippine Republic. Then the stations opened sister stations, initiating the post-war growth of radio in the country, mostly backed by families in big business and newspaper interests, such as the Elizaldes, the Sorianos, the Roseses, and the Lopezes. The radio industry expanded rapidly to the provinces, first in Cebu. In Mindanao, new stations opened in 1949 and grew into nationwide networks. The late 1940s and the 1950s saw the emergence of religious and educational non-commercial radio. The government developed a nationwide network of 14 stations. The growth of the radio industry in the Philippines after the war was phenomenal. Before the war, it took almost 20 years to establish five stations. In just 30 years after the war, the number grew to 280. The years 1946 to 1957 are called the golden years of Philippine radio. New program formats excited audiences. Recorded music became the standard as the recording industry grew. Light classics and American popular music remained the favorites, but local renditions and adaptations were also popular. Soap operas began in 1949. Aimed at housewives, radio dramas were sponsored by soap companies, hence the name soap opera. Quiz and children's programs, talk shows, the poetical joust called Balagtasan, and the ever-popular amateur singing contests delighted audiences. In 1968, ABS-CBN's DZAQ Radio Patrol became the first 24-hour news and public affairs station. It was so successful that other stations adopted the same format, such as the DZHP Vigilantes and DZXL. Commentary on current events gained a following. The language of broadcasting changed. There were Tagalog programs before the war, but English was the dominant language. This trend was reversed in the 1950s. Provincial radio also broke the dominance of English as well as Tagalog. 
na mohila. Ayaw kahubog sa kalamposan. But like the comics magazine and films, Manila-based radio stations spread the Tagalog language through news, drama, and music. The increase in the number of radio stations introduced new radio personalities. A new generation of comedians was born, and with them, a more pronounced Filipino comic sensibility. Even if recorded music became the norm, some programs featured live singing. In provincial stations, stars were also made, with some attaining national popularity. With the film industry back on its feet and with television debuting in 1953, the more popular radio programs and radio stars once again crossed over to film and television. For the first time, some radio personalities ventured into politics. The invention of the transistor radio set partly explains the extraordinary growth of the radio industry in the 1950s and the 1960s. The transistor radio was small, light, portable, and ran on cheap batteries. It brought news and entertainment to the most isolated barrios. The arrival of television in the 1950s did not diminish radio's popularity. Unlike radio, television sets were expensive, bulky, and required access to electrical outlets. The rapid growth of the radio industry after the war threatened the viability of many stations. The intense competition gave advertisers considerable control over many programs. Unethical practices compounded the lack of professional training among many broadcasters. Some game shows were rigged, and payola, or under-the-table payoff for playing music supplied by recording companies, was rampant. Critics blamed the change in the radio regulation law for radio's uncontrolled growth. First, the President of the Philippines took over the power to grant franchises, and then Congress. A significant number of franchises were political favors. In 1972, President Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law, alleging a serious threat from communist insurgents. Marcos's first letter of instruction put all media in the control of the press and national defense secretaries. Then, Marcos crony Roberto Benedicto and Marcos's brother-in-law Benjamin Romualdez built the largest radio television networks in Philippine history. In 1973, broadcast operators organized the Kapisana ng mga Broadcaster ng Pilipinas, the KBP, supposedly a self-regulatory organization of broadcasters 
but controlled tightly by the government through the Broadcast Media Council, the BMC. On the other hand, Marcos made it unconstitutional for foreigners to own and operate the media, effectively Filipinizing ownership of Philippine media for the first time. To many, the change was revolutionary. To address charges of over-commercialization, the BMC imposed a limit of 13 minutes of advertising per clock hour. The military reviewed drama scripts, forcing a departure from the previous practice of writing the scripts just minutes before going on the air. It was undisguised censorship. But its unintended effect was the professionalization of drama script writing and the elevation of the status of the script writer. Perhaps the biggest positive impact of KBP-BMC control was on the growth of the local recording industry. Stations were required to play original Filipino music, or OPM. Local composers, singers, and musicians enjoyed unprecedented exposure on radio, challenging the dominance of foreign music. In spite of these, broadcasters and audiences resented government control. As in the Japanese period, suppression produced a heightened consciousness. Once again, the people longed for the lively, irreverent, and liberal radio programming before martial law. This consciousness would very soon lead to the forging of protest radio. In 1983, soldiers assassinated Marcos' rival Benigno Aquino upon his return from exile in the United States. Many in the press were so outraged that the floodgates of press freedom burst open. Newspapers and magazines critical of the dictatorship began rolling off the presses. The Catholic radio station DZRV covered the assassination, its correspondent annotating the event through a payphone. Many of the predominantly Catholic Filipinos took DZRV's stance as their cue to begin opposing the government. Several radio stations followed suit, covering the street protests led by Aquino's widow, Corazon. I am ready to call a snap election. In late 1985, Marcos called a snap election for the presidency in reaction to foreign criticism of his regime. The opposition organized a ticket and fielded Corazon Aquino. Radio stations covered the heated campaign and election, the fraudulent counting of ballots, the howls of protest, and the citizens' revolt that ousted Marcos. In fact, radio did not merely cover the revolt. It was a crucial participant. In the provinces, several radio operators hooked onto DZRV, allowing people in the regions to follow what was happening in Manila. Two weeks after the election, National Defense Secretary Juan Ponce Enrile and Philippine Constabulary Chief General Fidel Ramos announced a break from the government in a press conference. They acknowledged Corazon Aquino as the winner of the election and appealed to Marcos to give up power. Within two hours, Catholic Church leader Cardinal Jaime Sin went on the air over DZRV and asked the people to support the rebels. Soon after, there was a multitude on EDSA between the two military camps where the rebels were holed up. With busloads arriving from all over Luzon, the crowd swelled to a million at one point. Marcos loyalists in the armed forces failed to get close to the rebels as the people formed a formidable human barricade. On DZRV, Broadcaster June Keithley alerted the rebels about government troop movements and appealed to Marcos loyalists to switch their loyalty. Both sides were listening and both understood the impact of her broadcast. While other stations began to cover EDSA, 
Keith Lee moved to a clandestine radio station, which she called Radio Bandido. Provincial stations hooked onto Radio Bandido, delivering to audiences throughout the country a minute-by-minute account of the turmoil. Thousands from the Visayas and Mindanao were poised to come by boat to Manila, preempted only by radio reports that Marcos had left the country. On the third day of the revolt, Marcos went on government TV Channel 4 to belie reports that he had fled the country. He was unable to finish his announcement, emanating from Malacanang Palace, as rebels took over the Channel 4 studios. By February 25, the final day of the revolt, practically all radio stations covered Aquino's inauguration at Club Filipino. Meanwhile, rebels interrupted the TV coverage of Marcos's inauguration over Channel 9. The capture of Channel 4 and other TV stations was the turning point that led to the ouster of Marcos. But it was radio that first galvanized the people. One of the first acts of President Corazon Aquino was to sequester radio and television stations illegally acquired by Marcos and his cronies. ABS-CBN and others recovered their network, and in no time, radio returned to the free and spirited broadcasting audiences enjoyed before martial law. Aquino's term, however, was marred by several coup attempts by military forces. Emboldened by the EDSA experience, radio stations covered each attempt. In the most serious one, staged in the business center of Makati in 1989, radio again played a crucial role. On DZRH, Ray Langit negotiated on the air with the rebels for a ceasefire to allow civilians out of the battle zone. Both the rebels and the government troops were listening as stations throughout the country were once more hooked onto a live coverage of a real live drama. Eventually, the standoff was resolved. The rebels marched back to their barracks and President Aquino finished her term. Radio covered later revolts against Presidents Joseph Estrada and Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. But other media were also in attendance. Radio remained the principal medium that immediately informed listeners of fast-developing events of public interest, but television was no longer timid. Philippine radio has brought into the 21st century some of its problems in the past. Commercialism is still an issue as broadcasting continues to survive on advertising. Payola persists while some news and public affairs broadcasters practice envelopmental journalism, promoting political and commercial interests in exchange for a fee or favors. Elite control of a significant number of stations allows undue political bias in some programs. Congress, again, has the power to grant broadcast franchises. Radio has been used as a stepping stone to a political career. Some straddle both fields, a questionable practice. But there has also been progress. Long dominated by men, particularly news and public affairs, radio today has a significant number of women broadcasters commenting on the traditionally male subjects of politics and foreign relations. New technologies are changing radio programming. More portable and inexpensive equipment has increased the amount of live news coverage, allowing listeners to participate in the daily discussion of a range of issues that grip the nation. Programming has narrowed to music, news, and talk. Game, variety, and children's programs have migrated to TV. However, the soap opera remains as a keen storyteller on radio, even as it also gains a firm foothold on television. Exposure of OPM has waned, but contemporary Filipino music keeps a strong presence on the air. The history of Philippine radio reflects the struggle of Filipinos in the 20th century. Like other cultural forms, 
Radio has been dominated by the elite, who have used the power of broadcasting to increase their political, economic, and social control. But radio has also been an instrument of resistance, a force for change. As the major source of public information, radio interprets and transmits contemporary history. As the principal entertainer of the people, radio expresses the values and sentiments of Filipinos. As the people's most widely shared medium of mass communication, radio provides Filipino audiences a sense of nation. Sa lahat, sa inyo.